Good morning, South Point. It is Sunday. May not feel like Sunday. I've had multiple te- people tell me this week that they're losing track of the days. Well, this is Sunday, so hopefully you're here, and uh, hopefully this has given you some, some uh, structure throughout your week. Um, you know, with before all of this happened and our whole schedules have been turned around, one of the things that we had planned for the month of May that actually would have been last week is I had contacted a friend of mine to come down and do a, a one-day uh, spiritual direction retreat. And uh, in, in that time together, what he was going to talk about was about some spiritual practices and, and establishing some rhythms in your life spiritually. And um, hopefully we'll be able to get him down to do that later in the future. Um, but as I was thinking about that a little bit this week and thinking about how rattled we are in in a lot of our routines and our rhythms i i did want to encourage you that if you are feeling a little um still if you're feeling a little um unhinged that it's important to try to build a life rhythm a life rhythm of rest and work we're going to talk about some of that today um but but make sure that you build a structure of life I hope that you're getting out of bed at a somewhat decent hour every morning and getting dressed and taking a shower and brushing your teeth and, um, you know, doing the sorts of things that you need to do. Um, Spending time with the word in the word each day is an important part. Continue to pray and to to have those rhythms. I want to also say that it's probably good that you limit your news intake to a certain time of day and a certain amount of time each day. I know some people are getting really overwhelmed by uh, reading all the news. Um, But what we want to try to establish in our lives is some healthy rhythms and some healthy patterns so that we don't get overwhelmed with an ongoing, long-term quarantine that we're in the middle of. Don't let worry carry you away. You don't need to. And uh, before we pray here this morning, as we jump into the word, I did want to remind you about one verse um, that, that Jesus spoke for us. It's recorded in the, the Gospel of John about peace. And I think it's important for us in the middle of this time as we're trying to endure, trying to be patient, trying to wait for things to settle out in our world. Um, I think that this verse in John 14 is important for us to hear and and digest this may be the the word you need to write on your a little note and stick it on your mirror or something john 14 27 this is jesus speaking here's what he said he said peace i leave with you my peace i give to you not as the world gives do i give to you let not your hearts be troubled neither let them be afraid we're called to peace and uh so this morning as we begin and as we we jump into the word together i want to pray that we would be a people of peace that we'd be walking in peace living in peace uh, in the midst of the life that we find ourselves in so if you will go ahead and and join with me and let's pray as we we start off this this morning service thank you god for a new day thank you lord that it is sunday And we thank you, God, for an opportunity to gather together. We again, as we've prayed before, we thank you for the technology that allows us to do this. I'm so grateful that that we can uh, meet in this way, that we can connect in the ways that we've been connecting, even in the the midst of a, a period of time where we're physically separated from each other. And Lord, I do pray that this morning that everyone who is part of this service today would be able to hold on to the peace that you give i pray if there are any here that are worried as as things begin to slowly reopen at least in other parts of the world and for some of us being called back to work and and getting um, more and more freedoms being restored and with the anxiety and fears that that may kick off lord i pray that you would give us peace that we would lean on you, we would trust in you. I pray, God, that you would continue to give us wisdom in knowing how to navigate these things. Um, And I I thank you, Lord, that you've already been speaking to us 
about that, about how to navigate what is next. And Lord, we pray for wisdom. We pray for wisdom for the leadership of our church in, in knowing how to uh, take steps forward. We pray for wisdom in our, our, our local community, for those that are making the rules and regulations, that you would give them wisdom in knowing the right steps to take and the right recommendations and guidance to give. And beyond that, Lord, into our city and into our state, into our nation, into the world, we pray for wisdom and discernment and direction. And God, even if those that are in roles of leadership, even if they don't know you, I pray uh, that you would steer their hearts to make good decisions and good choices. Uh, the, the heart of a king is in your hand. You can direct whatever path um, needs to be directed. And so, Lord, we just pray that that would happen. And today, God, as we, we jump into your word together and we continue to study through Colossians, I pray that you would continue to allow that word to really go into our hearts and minds and that it would take root there. And that all the things that we have learned would be things that would aim us and, and give us direction in this life. Your word gives us everything that we need for a life, pursuing you and knowing you and walking with you. You are our creator. You know us better than we know ourselves. And you're the one who knows the best way to live. And so, Lord, we want to live that way. We want to experience it. So we pray that we would allow ourselves to be challenged and changed and transformed by your word here today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, one more thing before we uh, do jump on into the passage. I do want to tell you, uh, some people have asked you know, hey, what are we going to do as a church, and what's our timeline? Um, where are we going to meet? When are we going to meet? How is that going to work? And just want you to know that's uh, not a new discussion for the leadership team, for the elder team. We've been praying about that, thinking about that. Uh, we're trying to stay informed and to hear uh, communication from the, the school board. They're still waiting to figure out what, what's happening with the facility at Salt Creek that we usually meet in. Um, and, and we'll keep you appraised of the things that we find out. We're, we're just trying to be patient and, and uh, you know, follow along with what we're being asked to do as a, as a church, as a, as a viable part of our community, the community that we love, the community that we've chosen to be a part of. And um, so we'll, we'll definitely let you know and, and, and keep uh, communication coming. It, it may be fast. Um, <laughs> I would love it if all of a sudden, you know, in a week from now, the school calls and says, hey, it's, it's open. You can meet at this particular time. Th this is where we think it's safe to do. And, and if so, we'll, we'll get that news to you as soon as we possibly can. So stay, um, stay connected through the church app, um, Church Center, the app that we have. And um, keep coming to church on Sunday mornings. Connect with life groups. And we'll continue to get as much communication to you as we possibly can. So... Keep praying for that and pray for doors to open for us. All right. Well, this morning we are in Colossians chapter 3. We're going to finish chapter 3 and move into chapter 4 today. And, uh, <coughs> excuse me, actually we, we're, we're coming to the end of, of Colossians. We're, we've only got a couple weeks left through Colossians. And um, today we are going to look at Colossians chapter 3, verses 22, all the way into chapter 4, verse 1. And the title of the message this morning is Christians at Work. Well, we know that the workforce of the world has really been kind of turned on its ear in 2020. Nobody expected that 2020 was going to look the way it has looked. Um, it, it, this is very, very different. We are in, in the, the process of rethinking and relearning our jobs. For many of us, the way that we have always worked and the way that we have always done our jobs, it looks very different right now than it did six months ago. Even if you've had the same job for 20 years, um, things are changing. Nearly every industry has been disrupted and impacted. And, and some businesses will never function the same way again. That's just part of the change that has come through this. And we know that it'll probably be several years before we even understand the, the impact on the economies of the world, how they've been affected. But in that, 
uh, I do believe that we will recover and that things eventually will um, will settle in such a way as we adapt and we make the changes necessary. And, and there will be a new normal. Uh, we'll be able to settle into a normal life again. I uh, said from the very beginning, I can't tell you when that's going to be, but I do believe that that's going to happen. But here's the thing. Change, any kind of change like that, change is uncomfortable. But change is often beneficial. It, it is uncomfortable. We don't like it. It doesn't feel good. We don't like to even imagine it but it also can be very beneficial. We can learn and we can grow when things change because really what happens is it lets us reassess the parts of our lives that are affected. And in, in this case, the work world has been affected and, and so we can reassess it a bit. And last week in Colossians, we talked about the people that we've been spending so much time with, family life, what it's been like around the house, the, we, we looked at Christians at home last week. Today, Christians at work. Um, we talked about the, the, the people that we spend so much time with, those that we're married to. It was um, wives and husbands, and then our children, children and parents, and we looked at that. But this week, we talk about the people that most of us probably haven't seen face-to-face -face in quite a while, but are still probably in almost daily contact with. That is, our coworkers and our bosses. All right? And just like every part of our lives, our relationship with Jesus affects our work life. And today, we're going to examine Christians at work. Now, even if you don't work outside the home, all right, if you are a student right now, or if you are retired, or if you are a stay-at-home parent, I still want you to pay attention too, because some of the concepts that we're going to talk about here are still going to be important for your life. Um, whether or not you'll ever work outside of the home again. Um, but before we jump into the passage, I really feel like I want to explain to you the very first word, all right? Um, in Colossians 3.22, the first word that pops up there is bond servants. Now, the Greek word that is translated bond servants in my Bible, your Bible may translated differently. Sometimes it's translated as bond servant, other times as just servant, other times as slave. All right. Um, the, the Greek word is the word doulos. And I don't tell you the Greek word just to make you know that I studied to figure this out, but it's important to know that word because that word sh shows up so many times in scripture. And today um, it's going to be really cru crucial in the rest of what we learn about, this doulos, the bond servant. And it is referring to a servant that is bound by something, a bond servant, all right? And in the Roman Empire, the way that looked was in slavery, slavery. But it was a little different than our usual impression of slavery, all right? When we think about slavery, we think about uh, the American slavery that happened in the 1800s, generally, and the pictures that we have, the, the movies that we have seen that depict slavery, the books that we've read, it's usually always in that context. But slavery has been around as long as people have been around, okay? And slavery was a huge part of the Roman Empire, uh, under which Colossa was, was a, a, a city underneath the Roman Empire. In fact, the Roman Empire itself was built on this sort of labor force. Believe it or not, historians estimate that roughly half of the entire population of the Roman Empire were slaves. Now, they argue about how many people were actually in the Roman Empire. To try to nail down an actual population number is hard. But across the board, they say that probably half of those people um, were slaves. Now, comparatively, at the height of slavery in the United States, so if you go back and look at the 1860 U.S. Census, which I did, <laughs> um, b before the, the Civil War was complete, there were 3.9 million slaves in America. 3.9 million slaves. And the entire population of the United States at that point was 31.4 million. So if you do the math, that's 12% of the population were slaves in America at that time. 
12%, which is still a large number of people, but that's not close to the 50% that it would have been in the Roman Empire. Every other person that you met in the Roman Empire would have been a slave. Now, there's a difference, though, and I want you to know that there's a difference between what it was like to be a slave in America in the 1800s versus being a slave back in the first century in the Roman Empire. There's a big difference. In fact, most bond servants had a very different quality of life uh, than the brutal manual labor and living conditions of slaves in America. The, the slavery in America was some of the worst in the world. Um, the slave trade was some of the most disastrous, horrendous things that ever happened in the history of people. Uh, the, the, the middle passage taking African slaves on these slave ships across to the New World. Horrible, horrible conditions, awful things. Uh, but back in the first century in the Roman Empire, lots of people um, that we would not ever imagine to be slaves were slaves. In fact, most doctors, most teachers, and business people were actually slaves. They were servants. They were always attached to households of Roman citizens. So there were two people in the Roman Empire. There were the free Roman citizens and everybody else who were usually servants. Apprentices in the trades. So if you were going to learn a skill to, to be a blacksmith or learn how to make shoes or tents or build houses, uh, all the apprentices in the trades were usually servants who hoped to one day purchase their freedom. Some bond servants in the first century in Rome could own their own property. They could live independently, but they were still attached to the household of a Roman um, master. Now, the other thing that I want to point out as we read through these verses is that this passage of Scripture uh, doesn't address whether slavery was right or wrong in the eyes of God. All it's trying to do is give instruction on how to live in a society that is structured this way, which is how Colossa was. Um, in fact, when we finish Colossians, the next book that we're going to jump into as a church is a tiny little letter that we're going to spend one week on called Philemon. And Philemon was um, a slave owner, a master of a particular slave named Onesimus, um, and, and we're, we're going to see this interaction that happens between this slave and his master with Paul as an intermediary trying to heal the relationship there. And that's what we're going to look at when we're done with Colossa. Um, but but th this, this passage here, as we, we look through it, even though it's not a kind of one-to-one -one conversion, it's not apples to apples, the principles that we find in this little passage best apply to our modern society in the employee-employer relationship, okay? So when we go through here and we look at the, the words like bond, servant, and master, I want you to, to view it more as the way that it works in our culture, which is it's usually bosses and employees, employers and employees. Um, but like I said, just, just as Jesus is to be the Lord of our homes, he is to be the Lord of our workplaces, which means that a Christian should have a different view of work. A Christian should have a different work ethic. And a Christian should have a different understanding of the work relationship that happens between an employee and an employer than non-believers. You're different. One of the things that we've learned over and over, and you'll continue to learn as you study Scripture, is God changes you. And the way that you view the world is different when you become a Christian. Okay, so that's my kind of long introduction before you get to read it, but now you know what a bondservant is, you know the context. So let's read it together. Colossians 3, starting in verse 22, here's what it says. Bondservants, employees, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, your bosses, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. Masters, 
Treat your bondservants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Okay, let's talk a little bit about work. Our work life is a huge part of our lives. That's why this is so important. It's a huge part of our lives. In this country, generally, if you had a full-time job, you would expect to work about 40 hours a week. Okay, and if you worked 40 hours a week, and starting out, most places, that job translates into getting a couple weeks off a year. And so if you work 40 hours a week for 50 weeks a year, and let's say you get your first full-time job, if you get it right out of high school, you're between 18, 19, 20 years old, or if you went on and went to college maybe, maybe you're in your early 20s, depending on how far school you went. But still, let's say you're right around the age 20. And if most people retire around age 60, 65, you're talking about 45 years of 50 weeks a year and at 40 hours a week. So if you do the math on that, that equals about 90,000 hours of the most productive hours of your lifetime. 90,000 hours. That's a lot of hours. A lot of hours. And most of us will have to have jobs outside the home for the majority of our lives. That's what most people will be doing. So work is a huge part of our lives. According to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, if you want to have a family, there's even more likely uh, of a chance that you're going to have a job for that long of a time because you're going to be providing for other people. Um, in families with children, and this just came out last month, actually the middle of April of 2020, the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics says that 64.2% of families with children are dual income families with both parents working outside of the home. And... We know that no matter where you live in the world, work is worldwide, right? There's, a, uh, there's an organization that, that studies work statistics worldwide in developed countries. Um, there are a couple key exclusions to this. It's called the OECD, um, but it's mostly for uh, democratic free countries. So the communist countries don't show up here and um, some of the other other countries don't. So the, the big ones that you won't see in this list is things like China, a communist country, and, and Russia. Um, you won't see those, those in, this, in these lists, but most other developed countries are in there. And on average, it says that in the United States, the average full-time worker works 38.6 hours a week. Okay, so just under 40 hours a week. Uh, if you want to know the lowest number of work hours in a week that award goes to germany with 34.3 hours a week so a few hours less per week and the highest this was interesting to me the highest um, work week the longest work week uh, across developing nations and developed nations is our neighbors to the south mexico comes in with 45.1 hours a week all right now, here's another interesting stat. European countries work 19% fewer hours per year than the United States. So if you want to work a little less, Europe might be the place to live for you. And on top of that, all European countries and Australia and New Zealand, all of them have laws for a minimum of 20 days of paid time off per year, in addition to paid public holidays. So you do that and add the weekends in, that's a month off a year, guaranteed by law in all of those countries. And if you really want to find the best place for the longest amount of paid time off during a year, you want to move to Austria. Because in Austria, the Austrians have a minimum of 38 days of paid time off per year. And if you add the weekend days into that, 104 weekend days, you put that together, that's 142 days off a year. Lots of time to ski on the Austrian Alps if you live in Austria. So that's kind of what happens. But my point with all this is we work a lot and there's a lot of hours to be invested in work. So what do we need to understand that the Bible teaches us about work? Because I think that it's important that as Christians we understand a little bit of the theology 
of work, a work theology. What does God think about work? How has God established work? Where does it fit in, into things? Because it affects the way that we work, okay? And I know that sometimes work feels like slavery. When we read this and you're like, bond servant, a slave? Yeah, that's my job. <laughs> like, that's how I feel. I know it does feel like that, but listen, work is not, work itself is not the result of the fall. And that may come as news to people because some of us, I think, view work in this very negative sense and think work is just, that's the curse. We're cursed because of sin and therefore we have to work. No, that's not true. Actually, we were created to work, okay? To be involved in the care of the planet and its resources. Part of being made in the image of God is that we are made to work like God works and to do some of the things, have the ability to do some of the things that God does and has done for us. God, the great creator, the almighty God, worked to create this world and to create the inhabitants that are on it. Okay, it tells us in Genesis, for six days he worked and on the seventh he rested and enjoyed the work that he had completed. All right, there's no sin in the world at that point. On the very first week um, when, when he has rested, there, there's no sin, he, but he's working. And then he invited his creation to join him in his work by employing Adam to name the creatures of earth, to tend to the garden, and cultivate the earth. It tells us in Genesis 2, and, and if you're aware, uh, the fall has not taken place yet in Genesis 2. But in Genesis 2, verse 15, it says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden, listen, to work it and keep it. He was put in the garden to work. And work is part of the blessing of being human. It's not a curse. Now we do know that our work has been cursed since the fall, but work itself came before the fall. So one of the things that God told Adam after, after he and Eve sinned is he said, now when you work in the garden, now when you're trying to plant things, you're going to also have to deal with weeds. You're going to have to deal with, with toil to make these plants grow and to flourish and to thrive. That is part of the curse. But as God's people, we are called to work. And we need to have that in our theology to understand that work is part of who we're created to be. In 2 Thessalonians 3.10, Paul writes this. He says, if anyone, specifically speaking to the Christian uh, family there, he says, if anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Now, such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly, and to earn their own living. Why? Because work is part of what we are created to do. And that is how it's supposed to be. Now, you might say, well, I don't get that. I don't understand that because in my mind, it seems like it would be so much better. If I could pic- picture the perfect life, it, then I would, I would think that it would be best to be able to sit around all day and watch TV and never do any work at all, or sit around and just play video games for hours and hours and hours, forever, or just consume and lounge. If I could just sit by the pool and have somebody bring me food and drinks, and I could just hang out forever and just eat and lay around, I would be so fulfilled and so happy and so full. But it's not true. You might really enjoy that for a little while, And some of you who have been quarantined too long now have got to the end of the binging of Netflix or Disney Plus or video games or whatever you're doing, and you're finally like, ugh, this is gross. Some of you are like, oh, no, I still need another couple months to do that. But either way, it will not bring you fulfillment in your soul. It might distract you for a while. It might be fun for a while. It might feel good for a while, but it will not bring fulfillment to you as a person. Why? Because you are not created to do that. When we participate in the good work 
that God provides for us to do, we find ourselves honoring God. Because uh, in the same way, God gave us this planet to enjoy and to explore and to develop, to work. Work allows us to produce and create and invent and generate things, which gives us joy and satisfaction and brings the potential of the earth to its fullness. It's part of how God set things up for us to discover the resources of earth and to bring those things together, to be able to understand how cobalt works, this mineral that we can dig out of the earth and then turn this into chips and and things that will work and build electronics. That happened through work and the cultivation of, of the earth's resources. Now, I will say this about work. Even though I tell you you're, you're made to work and you should work, not all jobs provide this. Okay, so you might say, well, okay, yeah, if we've got this real high and lofty work, this job that allows me to do great things for earth and for humanity, I can see that being as God-honoring work, but hey, my job isn't that way. That's not the type of job I have. Well, and I understand, not all jobs provide that sort of satisfaction, and your current work role may not line up with the work God has given you and called you to. That's when your job kind of just becomes a grind. But work itself, and this is important that we know, work itself is a gift given by God. Um, For those of you who are with us Back when we went through the Gospel of Matthew, we did a three-part mini-series in Matthew on heaven. And some of you were surprised to hear my opinion, and it's just an opinion, but I believe that we're going to work when we're in heaven. Now, it's going to be very different work. It's going to be fulfilling work. It's going to be work that you want to do, and you're not going to have to work to survive any longer. Our needs will be taken care of, but it will be the sort of work that is so fulfilling It'll be the work that we're designed to do. And it's fun to think about what that might actually be. And um, that's one of the questions that I provided for your life groups this week is to have that, that, that conversation, to think about, hey, if you could do work, and, and not have to get paid for it, but work that you think would enjoy and bring, that you would enjoy that would bring life to you, what would that job be? So you can be thinking about that this week um, as you go through your week. But no matter if you love it or if you hate it, we all have work to do. And how we are to work in relationship to others is what Paul's going to address as we've, we've read here in Colossians. So let's start walking through it verse by verse here. And we start with the whole employees and employers thing. What's the first thing that he says in verse 22? Bond servants, employees, obey. The first thing that we recognize here is obedience. And here's the thing. Christian employees are called to cooperate with the people we work with and work for. We're called to cooperate. Some people resent the fact that they have to work to survive in life, and so they push against everything that they're asked to do. I've had coworkers like that in the past, where it does not matter what your boss asks you to do, that person is going to grumble, they're going to complain, they're going to push back, they're going to try to get out of it, um, because they just don't want to work. And they think that work is a curse, I hate that I have to work, and I'm going to be angry with the fact that I have to work, and I'm always going to fight against it. Well, you know what, that's a miserable coworker to have. (laughs) Um, Don't be that person. You're not called to be that person. Um, And how does that sometimes play out? He says here, it plays out in eye service. What what is that? Or as people pleasers. Eye service is when you're doing something only when your supervisor is watching you. You need somebody looking over your shoulder to actually do the work. Um, One way that I can illustrate this, I remember back when I was in high school and I was part of the high school football team. When we'd start practice uh, after school, we'd go out and we'd start out and do stretches and, and start warming up and, and we'd have all these calisthenics that we'd have to go through. And one of the things that I always remember is one of the things that we had to do was leg lifts, all right? And leg lifts is where you're laying flat on your back and then you, you lift your legs up just a few inches off the ground and you have to hold it there and hold it there and hold it there 
and then then they make it even worse. It's like lift them up, now spread them out, now back together, now down. There's one, okay? And then you do that over and over and over. And, and uh, what would happen is, is you're all out there on the field and lifting your legs. The coach would walk by to make sure everybody's doing it. And what would happen is as soon as the coach would walk by, especially linemen, because they usually had the biggest legs, the coach would walk by, boom, the legs go down to the ground. Until the coach looks back, oh, legs back up. Okay, he sees me. Okay, no, no, down again. Like, we're trying to avoid it, right? If he's watching me, my legs are up. But if he's not watching me, forget it. I'm not doing the work. Well, that's the, the sort of thing that is being described here. That's the, the eye service that he's referring to. And, and that kind of behavior of being one of those workers who only works when the boss is working, those are hard habits to break. But what he says here is he says, we don't do that. We're going to obey, not just with eye service or people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, because look what he says here. Not that we fear our employer, or you, you fear the coach, not, not because of that, but because you fear the Lord. Um, sometimes people might look at me and say, wow, you're a pastor, huh? So I guess God's your boss. That's, that must be pretty nice. Are you kidding me? My boss is omnipresent, omnipotent, and omniscient. That means he knows everything. He's all powerful and he's in all places at once. I mean, you, you think about that there, okay? But what this actually tells you is not only is your boss around you all the time, but it's, that's for all of us because all of us who are Christians are working as unto the Lord. He is watching. He is paying attention. And what we do is not just serving our boss. We're actually serving the Lord um, first and foremost. Now, one of the differences for employees versus slaves, and, and remember, that's who he's writing to. He's writing to these bond servants, these slaves of the Roman Empire. One of the differences is that we have some amount of freedom if an employer asked us to do something unethical or something that would dishonor God. So when he tells the slaves here, he says, you've got to obey him, obey him in everything. There is a slight difference for us because we're not slaves and, and they, the, the servants that Paul's writing to, they didn't have the option to quit and find a new job. But you do, all right? Our loyalty should be First and foremost, to God. We obey our bosses as we obey the Lord. And if those things conflict, we always go with God. If your boss says one thing that conflicts with something that God would say, that's a good reason to leave that job and to move on from that place. And and that's where we always have to do it. But beyond that, if there's a spot where the Lord has provided this work for you to do, and this is what your boss is asking you to do, even if you don't like it, as long as it's not conflicting with God, you should go the route that your boss is asking you to do. That's what we're, we're called to do, to cooperate with the people we work for. All right, and then he goes on in verse 23 and 24. He says, Whatever you do, work heartily, as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. The second thing that we see here today is that we are working truly for the Lord. That word heartily, um, whatever you do, work heartily, means with your, it's, it's suke, it's soul. With your soul. Put yourself into it. Do it and do it well. Um, remember that, yes, the greatest boss on earth is an imperfect human. And we've got to lift our eyes higher and find a greater purpose for our work on earth, no matter what the work is. So whether or not you get paid for it, whether or not it's classified as essential or not, every Christian has work to do that God is calling them to do. Every one of us. Every Christian is on mission in sharing the good news of the gospel, right? In whatever sphere of influence uh, they have. So if you have a job, you might say, well, my work isn't like directly honoring God necessarily. I, you know, I'm an electrician. And I work pulling wire and building circuits. Well, part of your job and part of your work is not just for the company and for the boss, but it is ultimately for the God who you serve. So how do you take your job as an electrician and share the good news of the gospel? Does that mean witnessing to the people that you, you know, the residential homes you go to? Possibly. 
Does it mean to witnessing to your coworkers? Possibly. But it certainly means working in a way that reflects your Christian principles, that reflects who you are in Christ, and, and shares the love and the goodness and the light of Jesus everywhere you go. Because that's who we are. Christians are scattered throughout the world, in every sphere, in every industry, in every corner of the world, sharing the gospel, that the world would know the truth of the gospel. And learning to work well is one of the ways that we develop into the people God has created us to be. We learn to create with the creator and to produce with the producer. He is the one we are ultimately working for and looking towards. He will be the one who rewards us. We are his servants. Okay? And now he, he goes on a little bit and he says, and I understand, even though I'm telling you to obey, there's going to be some of these bosses that are just bad bosses. There's going to be some of these masters of the slaves that are doing wrong. And that's what he says in verse uh, 25. He says, for the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he's done, and there is no partiality. Okay? Um, if you've had a job, and it doesn't take very long, you've had a job or two, it doesn't take a long time to find bad bosses. That's part of working in the world. There are a lot of bad bosses. Why? Because power over other people is a seductive sin. That's something that a lot of people fall to. If they get an opportunity to oppress others, they do. They step into a role of authority and they abuse it. Um, abuse of power has always been a problem in the world and it always will. But as Christians, we reject that type of leadership. Okay, Jesus explained to us the way a Christian is to serve and a, a Christian is to live. Matthew 20, verse 25 to 28. But Jesus called them, his disciples, his followers, and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. That's a bad boss. And their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you, among Christians. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man, Jesus Christ himself, even as he came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. What we are called to as Christians, whether we are employees or employers, we are called to servant leadership to work in a way that serves others. And what he says here, when he talks about these wrongdoers, he says, listen, don't hold grudges against your boss or your ex-boss. Your, your, the bad bosses that are out there, don't hold, grudges as, uh, don't hold grudges against them. Okay? Bitterness will destroy you unforgiveness in your heart will lead to bitterness and bitterness is poison that will eat you alive I, i've met many people who still remember a boss from 10 years ago 20 years ago they're like that boss was awful i hate that guy still to this day okay you you think that that's holding something against them is is damaging them but it's not the only person it's damaging is you and it's damaging the way that you can function now as an employee all right? Don't hold grudges. That bitterness will wreck you. Let the Lord deal with that person. Because that's what he says. He says, you don't worry about the, the wrongdoers. They'll be paid back for the wrong. There's no partiality. The Lord is going to be the one that judges that person. He will be the one that repays them. For you, you just be free. Especially if you're no longer underneath that, that boss any longer. Let it go. Learn the lessons from their poor leadership and don't repeat it, of course, but let it go. And then finally here, the, the last verse that we look at here today, chapter 4, verse 1, says, Masters, so that's the employers, the bosses, treat your bondservants, your employees, justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Anyone in any role of leadership or authority is going to answer to God someday for their behavior in that role. 
all right? Now, that should be for those of you who are bosses and who have employees or people underneath your leadership and your authority, that should be terrifying. But it should also be clarifying. Terrifying in that you realize everything you say and do in those employees' lives, that's, that role has been given to you, but you have great responsibility before God in how you treat those employees. And God is going to have you answer for everything that you do with those underneath your authority. So that part's terrifying, but it is also clarifying. If you are called to lead others, lead, but learn to lead well. And here in this verse, we get three key features to good leadership. All right? So if you're taking notes and you want to know what those are, here they are. Justice. He says, treat the, the servants justly. So with justice and fairly. So fairness. And finally, humility. Humility. Why? Because he says, knowing that you are under authority as well, that you have a master in heaven. So justice, fairness, and humility are three ways that Christian bosses should treat their employees with justice, with fairness, and with humility. It, it reminds me of a, an Old Testament verse in Micah 6, 8, which says, He has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But listen, but to do justice to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Those are ingredients of servant leadership uh, that, that reflect well to our Savior. Now, many people, I, I think that when, if you told them, yeah, at church today, we talked about work and how that that's supposed to look and what our relationships as employees and employers should be. I think that uh, many people wouldn't think that our faith in Jesus would have much impact on our lives at work. For a lot of people, they think, well, that's just your, your faith, your relationship with God. That's just like a Sunday morning thing. That doesn't affect the work week. You know, that's just for something that you do on the weekend and, and your side part, you know. But, but no, when we say that Jesus is our Lord, what we're really saying is he's our master. He's our boss. He is the one above everything else. And we really mean that, that He being our Lord becomes the center of everything in our lives. He is the master. We are the servant. Paul himself describes himself multiple times throughout Scripture with that word doulos, the bondservant. He says, I am a slave to Christ. That He is my Lord. I am His servant. That's who we are. That's who we're called to be. The world without God would, would reject that. They say, well, you're a slave to God? That sounds terrible. Because they believe that the best life that we could possibly live is, would be one that is absolutely free from everyone and everything to be ultimately independent. That's what we think. We think if we had perfect freedom, meaning we, money can't hold us down, you know, uh, politics can't hold us back, our, our, our physical bodies are healthy and strong. There's nothing in our way. We're totally free. We're totally independent. That's where I would find the greatest amount of freedom and life and, and peace and joy and fulfillment. But that belief is untrue. And it's unattainable. It never ends. It's, uh, to, to quote Bob Dylan, you got to serve somebody. That is one of his songs from way back when. We are made to be intertwined and permanently connected to our Creator, that we are in Him and He is in us. And this relationship, this relationship also defines Christians at work. So with that, I'm going to pray for us as we finish here today. Lord, we thank You for Your Word. And I know this is a different kind of message today, but I pray, Lord, that the the bits and pieces of information that we gathered here today would help shape our understanding of work. I pray, God, that you would give us work to do that is meaningful in this life and that we would experience some of the satisfaction and fulfillment that comes from working as we're called to work. But even more than that, Lord, I pray that no matter what work we have and what work we do, that in the middle of it, Lord, we'd be able to set our hearts and minds on you and see you in it. That our work would not only 
positively impact the earth and the people around us, but it would also positively impact our own souls and our own hearts. That we would be able to look to you for our hope. We'd be able to look to you for our reward. We'd be able to look to you for our fulfillment and our joy. And we pray, God, that as we continue to allow you to transform every corner of our lives, that you would transform us as employees, as employers, wherever we find ourselves in the work world, and that even our work and even our jobs would be an area that we would bring glory and honor and praise to Jesus Christ. Thank you for your word, and I pray, Lord, that we'd be able to hear the things that you're speaking to us and that you would use it to impact us and change us and build us up as your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, hey, um, usually at the end of a service, when we're meeting together, we have a time of responsive worship, and today we've got a, a worship video for you to be able to link to. But a couple things that I want you to think about um, in response, and, and maybe that's now as you're l- watching the worship video, or maybe it's just throughout your week, um, I want to encourage you to take a personal inventory and to ask yourself, hey, what is my work life uh, actually like? Is my work underneath the Lord's leadership? If I always tried to separate those two and say, this is my work world and this is my you know, religious world or my spiritual world, but they're supposed to be together. And can you find ways to serve the Lord through your work? And to really ask yourself, hey, is Jesus the Lord in this area of my life? And hopefully we'll be able to hear some, some great things that God has spoken to you throughout the week. And uh, we'll be able to catch up again very soon. Hope to see you at Life Group if you can make it to one of those. Or on the Kids Zoom meeting or the Ignite meeting that's happening on Zoom. And uh, I pray that you have a wonderful week ahead. God bless you. Love you. See you soon. Bye. Thank you.